paint factory owned by Harry Paint Factory, 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 owned by Harry. Paint Factory, owned by Harry. Paint Factory, owned by Harry. Paint Factory, owned by Harry.
Lauren, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, John. Good evening. And Lauren, you know that our video is disabled. I do. Just give me one moment. Mayor Moore and council members, just so you're aware, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty with the video feature, and it appears that there's some kind of glitch in our attendees also. Does this mean I have shaved for absolutely no reason? The vice mayor is outraged. I would think you could take your outrageness to the next door. I could, but I, I think they already are sufficiently and plentifully supplied without mine. And it has nothing to do with the flag that they put on you? <laughs> Probably not, no. Mayor Moore, it is 7 p.m. if you'd like to call the meeting to order, and we will continue to work on the video issue. Uh, certainly, we can go ahead and do that. Um, thank you. I'd like to call to order the meeting, the joint meeting of the Katahdin City Council and the Six Sister Agency for the Firm of Katahdin Community Redevelopment Agency for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Ms. Burgess, would you give us a roll call, please? Council Member Harvey. Here. Council Member Sparks. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Vice Mayor Landman. Here. Mayor Moore. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, if you all will kindly join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to, the, flag to the flag of the United, of the United, States, United States of America, of America. America. and to, to the, the Republic. Republic. For which it stands, stands yes. one nation, one nation. Under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible 
with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thank you. Um, with the Pledge of Allegiance, um, Mr. Robert, could you give us an introduction of the staff that are present tonight? For mayor, members of the council, so um, myself, uh, Damien Obid, city manager. We also have uh, Angela Corder, who's the director of administrative services, Craig Scott, director of public works, the city engineer. Um, we have Michael Parrish, the chief of police, and Noah Howitt, the director of community development. And um, I would be remiss to also not mention uh, John Walker, our uh, city attorney. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would be looking for the approval of minutes for the regular meeting of March 9th, 2021 and the strategic planning special meeting of March 16th. Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, this is the vice mayor. I'll second with one correction. It does list me as remote uh, present uh, remotely for 316, but actually I was not in attendance. So I'd be happy to second this for that one small change to reflect my absence. Thank you. So we just need a motion. I have a second. I made that motion and I accept that change. Thank you, Councilmember Harvey. So we have a motion and a second. Can we please have a roll call? Councilmember Harvey. Yes. Councilmember Sparks. Yes. Councilmember Ford. Yes. Vice Mayor Landman. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, typically I try to do this earlier on, but I think I'm a little bit off tonight. Uh, I'd like to take a moment of silence just to recognize those um, folks that have had issues with the, uh, the victims of the Atlanta shooting recently. And of course, the Asian Pacific Islanders that have had uh, discrimination issues, etc. So if we could take a moment of silence to recognize those, that would be great. Thank you all for your indulgence on that. And now we'll go to announcements. Meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers. Performance for the Brown Act and adopted city council rules. The meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the city council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. Meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The city council may or may not choose to respond to comment as the government code allows. However, if the city council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statement that the city council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purposefully biased. Measure G supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all, and the maintenance of our street, park, and public buildings. See details on the web at fatalitycity.org. Citizens interested in receiving city fatality community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up at nickville.com or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888-777. It's our top pri priority to provide you with prompt and comprehensive customer service, and we continue to offer all city services. However, in the interest of public health, City Hall is currently closed for walk-in traffic due to the current health officer order. During this time, our services have temporarily transitioned to phone and web-based, as well as appointment by request. Staff continue to be available to answer your questions 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Like always, we'd love to hear from you. So please feel free to contact, contact the city at 707-792-4600 or info at katadicity.org. If you have non-emergency issues or have normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media channels available on Facebook, Instagram, Nickville, and Nextdoor. And do we have an approval of the final agenda? The mayor, uh, no proposed changes. Thank you, Mr. Obid. Now we'll move on to citizens' business. 
citizens, citizens, and public comment or consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any matter not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any items not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2017-02, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes and length per person for matters not on the agenda, and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for a reasonable time where a disability accommodation has been requested. So now we will move on to the consent calendar. Do we have any requests to pull any of those items? If not, I would be certainly- Mayor Moore, if I can interject, we do it. have a public comment. Oh, terrific. Ayers Weaver, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, one of the things that I really love about living in Katati is how our small little town is so compact and that I can pretty much go anywhere I need to go on foot or on bike, whether it's grocery shopping, the bank, uh, the post office and all that stuff. And of course, in my job as executive director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, it's my job to encourage people to use active transportation. Um, transportation accounts for 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions in Sonoma County. Um, and all of our uh, cities and jurisdictions have passed uh, climate action um, plans and resolutions. 20%, no, 30% of trips in the county are under two miles, which is, you know, an easy bike ride for, for most people. So by now, all of you should have received in the mail a letter from us uh, inviting you to participate as leaders of the city in our Bike to It Challenge, in which we're inviting you to take a pledge to ride a bike or uh, rather than drive a car to destinations that are within two miles. So I am hoping uh, that some of you, uh, Council Member Ford has already signed on, um, will join him and join uh, folks from the rest of the county in uh, taking that action. Uh, a couple other things that we have up I wanna tell you about really quickly. Uh, we are seeking a bilingual outreach coordinator. So if anyone uh, knows an individual or an organization that I should talk to that would uh, help us in addressing transportation inequity, we would love to hear that. Finally, we just um, participated in the National Bike Summit uh, because it was virtual this year. I was able to have my entire staff participate. And one of the highlights was a surprise visit from Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And the fact that we now have a bicyclist in that very important role um, is quite exciting and I think it's going to lead to a lot more funding for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure projects, which will be great uh, for Katadi and for all of the rest of the county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. And I just did get that invitation the other day. So thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm sorry. Anybody else in the uh, citizens business, Ms. Obed? I mean, Ms. Burgess? For our attendees tonight, just a reminder to use your raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment or if you're just dialing from your phone, dial star nine. And it appears that is the end of public comment. Thank you very much. Um, so my apologies on that. Now we will move to our consent calendar. So unless we have anybody that wants to pull any items, I would certainly entertain a motion on that. Move to approve. This is Council Member Harvey. Second, this is Council Member Ford. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Ms. Burgess, would you take a roll call, please? Council Member Harvey. Yes. Council Member Sparks. Yes. Council Member Ford. Yes. Vice Mayor Landman. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so now we we'll move any future um, agenda items. Uh, Mayor Moore. Yes. 
Um, I would like us to um, consider looking at our, um, if we have one, um, an environmentally preferable purchasing policy. Uh, if we don't have one, I would like us to take a look at um, implementing one. Uh, the Waste Management Agency has a model ordinance that is available for us to, um, to utilize. So would like that to come back. Thank you, Councilmember Harvey. Um, Mr. Obid, do you know if we do have one of those? Um, the policy is more around um, some type of non-recyclable materials, but um, it's fairly it's fairly old. I would say the practice is far exceed the policy. Um, so, I have talked to Zero Waste Sonoma about their model policy and um, about getting the temp their template when it's ready. I think they're working on that now. Thank you. It, it, it is ready now, so would be wonderful. And theirs was um, outdated also, it was from 1995. So I think it's pretty, pretty common that they are, they're a little outdated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move on to our regular agenda items. And we have a presentation on SB 1383. And who will be presenting on that one? Uh, so, Mayor, I'll just uh, step in here real quick. Um, we have uh, Leslie from Zero Waste Sonoma. She's the executive director there who's going to do the presentation. But I just wanted to um, point out one thing as we get into the presentation that makes us a little different than some other places in the county is that um, last year when we were doing the detailed rate review uh, with Recology, uh, as you recall, the city council negotiated some concessions from Recology, and um, those included uh, Recology absorbing the implementation costs of SB 1383, as well as the first year of operations. So um, th that may be part of sort of the standard conversation in most communities that there's a cost to uh, ramp up and start implementation of this, but that should not be our case uh, given the concessions that we implemented. We will, of course, that won't be forever. I mean, we we have an init initial kind of ramp up co cost that Recology is absorbing as well as a first year that they're also absorbing. But beyond that, at some point we will be paying for the program, but just not initially. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Leslie. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present on SB 1383, a bill focused on reducing short-lived climate pollutants in California. This is the most significant waste reduction mandate to be adopted in California in the last 30 years. This presentation provides a very high-level overview of the requirements for compliance with 1383. Next. So SB 1383 was passed in 2016 as part of California's larger strategy to combat climate change. The law was designed to reduce climate global, to reduce global warming super pollutants like methane, which is up to 84 times more potent than even carbon dioxide. Landfills are one of the largest producers of methane in the state. When organic material breaks down in a landfill, methane is produced and generated. So we need to move away from landfilling organic waste. And organic waste is food waste, food soil, paper, and yard waste. So the materials that go into your green bin. SB 1383 is also important because it addresses food insecurity in California. Organic waste compromises two thirds of California's waste stream. And food waste alone is the largest waste stream in California, roughly 18%. This is when one in five children go hungry every night in California. Next. SB 1383 is a statewide target that requires California to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% by the year 2025 as compared to disposal in 2014. And also increase edible food recovery by 20% by the year 2025. So I wanted to just restate, this is a statewide goal, not a jurisdiction by by jurisdiction goal. So while the regulations take effect January 1st, 2022, 
jurisdictions and the agency have the plan now so that they can be in compliance by the January 1st date. Next. So I'll just kind of go through the rulemaking, rulemaking process and uh, where we are. So the law was adopted September 26, um, or se September 2016. And there was a two year uh, informal rulemaking process that actually ended um, around December of last year. So um, the regulations take effect January 1st, 2022, as mentioned, and the state could begin enforcement of those regulations um, and hold the jurisdictions accountable at that date. Although Cal Recycle, the agency that's over, overseeing the enforcement is working with the jurisdictions. They, they wanna make sure that they're going at this from an education side and not an enforcement side um, at the time being. So by January 1st, 2024, regulations uh, will require that local governments um, take enforcement for compliance of the regulations. And then by January 1st, 2025, uh, the state will uh, review to make sure that they are achieving a 75% reduction of organics disposal and a 25% increase in edible food recovery. Next. There are many uh, responsibilities put upon the jurisdiction, but uh, the, luckily in Sonoma County, we have a joint powers authority, which is the agency that I uh, represent and we will um, assist and oversee many of these responsibilities on behalf of the jurisdictions. But I did want to review what they are so that um, the council is aware of what uh, is required for the regulations. So first, uh, jurisdictions are required to provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. Um, this will be an amendment as mentioned by the city manager uh, between the city of Katadi and Recology for these compliance measures. Next, uh, jurisdictions must conduct annual education and outreach to all generators. This is something that the agency and um, Recology are, are working on together and in, co in conjunction with the, with the jurisdiction and the city manager. So um, we will need to also make sure that uh, generators are informed about edible food uh, recovery. Each jurisdiction must plan for adequate capacity for recycling organic waste and edible food recovery. We are gonna be hiring a consultant to actually do this capacity study for us on behalf of all the jurisdictions and the region. And then there's also um, a need to, uh, do, to implement or expand the food recovery program. And this um, may require potential funding to, um, to these programs. So we are looking at alternatives to provide funding to expand food recovery. Jurisdictions must also produce certain levels of recovered, uh, or must, must also procure certain levels of recovered organic waste products like compost, renewable gas, and, um, and also uh, mulch. So those are requirements, and there's also requirements to purchase recycled content paper, which was referenced um, in the environmental uh, purchasing policy at the beginning of this presentation. The next role is monitoring and compliance in conjunction with enforcement. So education begins now so that we're ready for that enforcement piece January 1st. So this includes reviewing a commercial business to make sure that they have organics collection service and that they're following all the regulations. Um, then there's also a contamination monitoring re requirements of the contents in the container. This is something that Recology will be doing um, for your jurisdiction. And there's also, going to, there's also requirements for reporting that the jurisdiction must maintain records and keep information um, for their inf implementation. And we're working with the jurisdictions on a way to uh, manage all that data as well. Uh, lastly, um, I will be coming back to council uh, to adopt an ordinance or enforcement mechanism as required by the regulations. So that's something that we are developing a model of uh, right now and we'll be uh, working with the jurisdictions to pass that. Next. Each department within a jurisdiction also will know the impacts of uh, SB 1383. So for example, um, what we're doing now with all the city councils doing the presentations of um, introduction to 1383, and then also informing the city councils that they will be required to pass local, um, in local ordinances. City managers are involved with capacity planning, procurement, just overall planning of the implementation of 1383. Finance and legal uh, will be uh, reviewing the enforcement ordinance as well as the, any amendment to the franchise agreement. Purchasing staff will be central in procuring recycled organic products, including uh, paper. And uh, city park staff may be involved with um, applying compost or mulch onto the land. 
and the um, health department may be involved with enforcement, although we're still working out the details of that enforcement mechanism right now. Next slide. So the current status of implementation, uh, we are meeting monthly with all the jurisdictions, uh, a representative from all the jurisdictions, and actually our meeting um, is tomorrow. So that's where we will share with all the jurisdictions that the agency has, uh, has approved the model EPP ordinance that they can uh, look at to, uh, to implement or improve our, um, their own. So we are developing a memorandum of understanding between um, the jurisdictions and the agencies, and this delegates the responsibilities of both parties so that we all have clear understanding of who's doing what. We are also initiating a waste characterization study this spring, so that'll give us a better understanding of the organics being disposed in our landfill as of right now. We have started the outreach and education to uh, multifamily and commercial entities. So we, that, has been, that was announced last month. Uh, we did figure out the procurement of compost or mulch that your city would need to purchase. It's about 2,100 uh, tons annually. Um, there is a cost to that, which I'll go over in the next slide. And one of the things we did do is we applied for a two-year uh, Cal Recycle Food Recovery Grant. If we are awarded this grant, that will be great for the whole region because that will really help us to expand food recovery and, and help us meet our food recovery targets for, um, for the region. So next slide. So from here on out, um, as mentioned in February, we, we did send out those letters and we're working on the MOU. So this month we did pass the um, environmental purchasing policy. Uh, we're working on the model enforcement ordinance right now. We are also working on a, met, a, a model edible food recovery agreement. We are currently identifying tier one and tier two uh, food recovery generators for each jurisdiction. I did list within the staff report um, who, which businesses are fall under tier one and tier two. And uh, by April, the agency should finalize uh, its budget. So we'll know what, we'll finally have a number of what uh, uh, funding we'll be able to put towards implementation of 1383 through the agency. And then we hope to have the MOU finalized in June. And we'll do another round of letters and education outreach in July. And then October through December, we'll really be uh, working with all the jurisdictions to make sure we're in compliance by that January 1st, 2022 target date. Uh, next. So what we expect by January 1st is we'll have the enforcement ordinance in place with all the jurisdictions uh, that every account will have uh, organics collection. Generators are notified of SB 1383 requirements, the EPP policy in place, and then um, the enforcement plan also in place. And the, uh, we'll also uh, have the edible food capacity plan completed by that time as well. So I expect that Sonoma County be well on its way in compliance by that date. Next slide. I did just want to review with uh, Katadi that there is going to be some funding impacts to your jurisdiction. Um, I mentioned that procurement of compost, uh, that is an estimate of $20,000 to $26,000 per year. Um, but there is a way to uh, get a third party to help purchase um, compost. The reason why that regulation is in place for all jurisdictions need to purchase compost is the state wanted to make sure that if they were requiring organics to be diverted from the landfill, that there was enough markets throughout the state to actually purchase that compost. But Sonoma County is a very unique county in that we don't need to have jurisdictions buy compost because we're an agricultural community. And when we had our own, own composting facility, we didn't even have enough compost for all the ag demand. So we are looking at a program to find a third party way to help, um, to help this. Uh, it's new in the state regulations. So um, we will be you know, uh, forging on new territory to, to see how we can comply with that. But the state, Cal Recycle, is well aware that um, this is the situation in Sonoma County. So if we can't figure out that third-party way, I just wanted the um, jurisdiction to know that the cost of 2,100 um, tons of compost annually is that. There's also the funding requirement for food recovery capacity expansion. Most of our food banks, we know, are at capacity. We'll, we'll know the, the real picture once we do this food capacity study but um, there are requirements if we're at capacity that we need to expand that capacity to receive more 
edible food waste um, from generators. So we would be getting food waste from, let's say, the grocery stores, hotels, um, event centers when those come back online. There is staff time. We do meet um, with your city manager regularly to, to talk about um, reporting and other compliance mechanisms. Um, also, it was mentioned that there, at some point, there will be a franchise, franchise fee initiated for SB 1383 compliance through Ecology. And then there's also that enforcement of the regulations, which we're still working out. So uh, next slide. Um, so my colleague, Cincy Tan, who is the organics program manager, and myself are open to answer any questions you may have of these new regulations. Thank you, Ms. Lukacs. Um, it looks like we do have some questions from the council. Uh, council Member Ford. Uh, thanks. I was wondering if you could explain a little um, the edible food recovery. What does that mean? I presume you don't mean if I don't finish my dinner down at the Redwood Cafe, we got to do something to get it off my plate. Yes. Yeah, so it, it is all regulated through the health department and in meeting you know health codes, but it's it's excess food. So let's say a grocery store has food that's still edible that they get that to a food bank so that they could get redistributed, redistributed out to, to hungry people. But not your, your food scraps or not food waste that makes its way to the landfill. This is uh, edible food at the source. Thanks. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the council. I kind of had the same question as council member Ford. I was like, what does that edible food recovery program look like? I mean, we've got one grocery store in town um, and is it going to be part of uh, covering restaurants etc um, yes restaurants are part of, of tier two I believe um, and it's restaurants of a certain size so a city the size of Katati um, I'm not certain how much food recovery will be doing and that's why we really need to do that food capacity study because we really don't have an, an idea of the excess food, edible food being, um, you know, uneaten at the ho at the hotel or the restaurant or um, or the grocery store. So that's why we need to do this study so we have a better picture of what's really happening out there. And we will do the study city by city so that you'll have the information specific to your city. Thank you, Ms. Lukacs. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Council Member Sparks. Thank you. Um, I I had a question about the table with the tier one commercial generators and the tier two commercial generators in the staff report. Um, what, it, what, is a, what is the definition in this context of a food service provider and a food distributor? Uh, Zinzi, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, um, why don't you go ahead. Sure, yeah, so uh, a food, let's see. A food service provider, I believe is I'm not looking at the definition right now, but it's um, generally like, uh, what's it called? Organizations that are contracted to provide like, say, say for example, like catering, um, and then food distributors would be those big warehouses um, that, you know, they are the ones that distribute to grocery stores or restaurants. Uh, so yeah, th those are like the big generators of food. And um, to answer a, a previous question, no, it's not any, like Leslie said, it's not any food off your plate. Um, <laughs> it's not anything like that. It's mostly food that's been untouched. Uh, say, for example, in the case of a restaurant, uh, if, if there is a buffet, right, and they have a extra pan of noodles, say, that hasn't even been opened, it hasn't been put out for the public, um, it's, so it's still sanitary, it's still clean, then that food has to be donated, um, but not anything that is potentially unsafe to consume, that, that food is not required to be donated. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And uh, Vice Mayor Lemon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Lukacs, I wanted to ask uh, if you could flesh out a little bit, if we know at this point, I know it's early and not everything is in place, what enforcement and compliance might look like for single family generators. And I ask that because I know just from years of watching this, that compliance 
existing compliance with proper use of the waste stream is probably one of the number one problems that you deal with. So obviously to try and get the compliance required is going to require a big change in how we deal with that and enforce that. So I'm wondering if you have any clarity yet and how the industry will pivot to actually achieve that and what that would look like for the end user. So you are correct that compliance is something that we are still working out. It's a pretty big deal because there's a financial penalty tied to this legislation, tied to the regulations, and we aren't an enforcement agency. But we have had several meetings with the health department and the LEA, local enforcement agency, and we have since learned that they're really not in a position. They don't have the bandwidth, and I really heard that loud and clear that they don't have the bandwidth to do enforcement right now. So that was our original plan. So previous council presentations where we did this presentation, that was the thinking that they would take over just that final compliance component at that penalty phase. But they really don't have the ability to do that right now. So what we are thinking is that the agency may become the enforcer. That will be new for us. We are talking to our legal counsel to see how we could even do that. But this would have, enforcement would have to be funded one way or another, either through the agency fee and the agency pays down to the local enforcement agency or the health department, or the jurisdictions would have to pay individually. But at this point, as we work this through with the jurisdictions, it's looking like maybe the agency fee is the right way to go because we want to disincentivize landfilling. The whole idea is to get this material out of the landfill into people's, you know, into people's refrigerators and or into compost. So the higher the rate of the landfill fee is, the more incentive there is to compost and recycle more. So I don't have the answer yet. We're still working on it, but that's just the direction we're moving towards right now for enforcement. Well, I feel like we're kindred spirits. The state's given you a responsibility, but no tools or power to enforce. We often get mandates with no funding to accomplish them either. So we're kind of sharing that a little bit. But I think the direction sounds like a good one to enforce. I mean, having a JPA provides perhaps the greatest flexibility that we can have. So that sounds like a good direction to look into to me. So thank you for sharing. That's helpful. Vice Mayor, if I may add to Leslie's answer. So I should say that, you know, at this point, the agency is mainly looking to potentially enforce on the food recovery requirements. We don't anticipate taking on the enforcement for organics collection. So this means like for the curbside bin, if there are contamination in there, that is something that potentially Recology may take on with. So I should back up. I'm sorry. With the regulations of 1383, it is required that route reviews or what they call waste evaluations need to be done on residential and business bins to check for contamination and to make sure that people are actually using the bins correctly. So those route reviews will likely be part of your negotiations with Recology. And that's part of the enforcement and I suppose like monitoring. And so in terms of I should also mention that with the regulations, they specify penalties must be levied against businesses that are non-compliant, but penalties against residents are not required. However, you know, if the city of Katahdi wants to levy penalties against residents, you can certainly do that through the enforcement ordinance that Leslie mentioned earlier in the name. So I hope that answers your question. That's helpful. Obviously, as vice mayor, I never want to sit here and say we want to levy fines against our constituents. But I do think it would be interesting when the discussion comes how to make this system work the way it's supposed to look at what the impact is in terms of not meeting the goals of 1383 of extra costs for collection by with these contaminated collection, because I suspect that will continue without some sort of strong effort to change the system. It's it's just something that we as a public seem to do. So 
but that's helpful. Thank you for that extra answer. Thank you. Council Member Harvey? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Leslie, you mentioned that um, you had uh, talked to the health department and that they told you that they didn't have the bandwidth. My question surrounds why that direction and if that's the proper direction, is it appropriate that everyone has to abide by this and as was pointed out by the vice mayor, we often get edicts from the state with no um, money to back them up. If that's the proper place, rather than finding another spot, should we push be pushing uh, together harder on that? And are other jurisdictional areas, is that where they're placing that? And would we be doing something different if we went down a path of having someone else do it. I'm just trying to kind of figure out that because the county always tells us they don't, they can't do something. So that, that's what struck me. Yeah, this is a situation where, where the LEA is really understaffed. And the reason why, one of the reasons why the um, health department's nervous to take this on is because they don't, they're understaffed as it is, and there is a penalty to the jurisdiction of data if they aren't in compliance with enforcement. And if they're having a hard time keeping up with their current accounts right now, and then they take on 1383, even if they add another position, they, it would be hard for them to be in that spot to put the jurisdictions in a bad place if they can't follow through with all the enforcement requirements. So one thing that we discussed is enforcement um, for food generators is that tier one and then tier two. Um, tier two doesn't have to, enforcement doesn't begin for another two years. And so one thing that we're looking at is that the agency will do enforcement for the first two years of the tier one businesses, which is a much smaller pool. Um, we would likely have to hire an additional uh, staff person to do that. Um, but this is also a conversation with all the jurisdictions that I'll be having uh, tomorrow. Um, so we, and we all hope to move in the same direction. So um, whatever the plan is, you know, we hope to come up with that together. So we're all doing the same thing. Okay, because I mean, we as a city often get these edicts put upon us, whether or not we have the staff to do them or not. So, it has to come from somewhere and it means we don't do something else, but it's not okay. If the county health department is the spot where it rightfully belongs, not having the staff is not a good enough excuse. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up from the council. Um, do we have any comments from the public that they would like to make on this? Thank you, Mayor. Checking in with our attendees, please use your raised hand icon or dial star nine from your telephone. And that will end public comment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Lukacs and Ms. Tan. I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. I guess we'll move on from there. That will be an exciting period in time when that comes up. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to suggest we move a agenda item, but I don't know that we have any representatives here from the um, Asian American Anti-Racism Caucus or anything along those lines. Mr. Obey, you're not familiar with any of that? No, nobody's here that represents those organizations um, that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. Then we'll move on to our 2020 annual housing report to the uh, California Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you, Mayor Moore. I'll wait for the there. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and Lauren, I'll let you drive the presentation if you don't mind. Um, 
So yeah, as mentioned, tonight's presentation is on our housing annual housing report presented to the State Department of Housing and Community Development uh, for 2020. And Lauren, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit of background, uh, all cities and counties are required to have a general plan and one of those required elements of the general plan is the housing element. Uh, the housing element is essentially an analysis of the community's housing needs at all income levels and uh, identification of strategies to respond to and provide for those needs. They're updated on a four or eight year cycle and Katadi is currently in uh, an eight year cycle, which is going from 2014 to 2022. So we're in year seven of that eight year cycle. Um, we're required to provide a report annually to the Department of Housing and Community Development or HCD to document our progress toward implementing our housing element. Uh, and this needs to include removing governmental constraints on the development of housing, as well as meeting the regional housing needs assessment allocation. That's what's commonly referred to as RENA. Um, and just it's worth noting over the last few years, there's been some significant changes to housing element, both in the reporting requirements uh, and in the housing elements themselves. So kind of the mandated um, functions and requirements of the housing element document. Uh, those are identified and summarized in the staff report. Um, and we are moving forward to begin an update of uh, the housing element uh, in the next fiscal year. So the council will see some budget requests to cover the cost of that. Uh, and unlike most state mandates that cities get, there has been some funding to help assist with the cost of this in the form of some grants that have come down. Uh, and the council has seen multiple applications for those grants over the last year or two, uh, SB2, LEAP, and then most recently a REAP grant application, which was filed. We have not heard back on that. But it's worth noting to date, we have received $220,000 uh, in state funding to assist with the cost. We've spent some of this kind of supplementing our staff uh, to work on some of the state mandates, such as the ADU ordinance, uh, removing some of the um, barriers to housing, so kind of some of the by right elements, and then uh, the cottage housing ordinance, which will be coming to the city council next month in April. Uh, and then uh, we're also working on some objective design guidelines. And so we are working on some policy work that we're using that grant funding for, but we are keeping some of it in reserve to help offset the cost of the housing element update, which will begin in earnest, as I mentioned, um, once the fiscal year begins. So with that, we'll go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, table B from the attached report. And I do apologize for the formatting. Um, as the state keeps kind of piling on more and more requirements, the formats change, the cells get smaller. Uh, and then I will also say, as we get deeper into the years, there's more uh, information that is uh, summarized. So I do apologize. There is a copy of the report, but just to, just to summarize it, uh, in the beginning of this RENA cycle, the state did recognize that there was a downturn in the economy uh, and kind of gave everyone somewhat of a break, I would say, on their mandated housing needs. So our total arena allocation for this cycle was 137 uh, residential units. Um, I say a break in that, you know, we look better uh, to the state if we are closer to meeting that number. However, um, the climate and the perspective on the need for housing is definitely different in today's world than it was when this number was allocated. Uh, and the future allocation is going to uh, significantly increase, uh, we're anticipating. But as of today, um, in this cycle, uh, I should say, I'm sorry, as of January 1st of this year in this cycle, the city has built 100 residential units. So over the last approximately six years, we've built 100 residential units and are doing pretty well in meeting the RENA uh, mandate with the exception of the very low income uh, allocation. We were allocated uh, 35 units and we've only managed to build seven units to date in the very low income category. So we do have a 28 unit um, count remaining uh, and of staff is confident that we will be able to meet all the other income categories in this cycle, but I do not have um, confidence that we will get to uh, building the remaining 28 very low income units. We will build some uh, based on the progress we have uh, on some of our projects, but I'm not, I'm not confident that we'll meet that, that number. Um, there is um, 
comes still some significant development interest, but the, the once we get these projects entitled, uh, they seem to be stalling out as the folks, you know, seek actual financing to construct them, get some concrete bids on, on the construction uh, from local contractors. And there's a variety of reasons that are being cited. Uh, anything from just the cost of, of our local labor force uh, to the cost of materials. Um, you know, there, there's a variety of issues being cited and we do hope to spend some time trying to dig into that uh, a little bit with this housing element update because while, you know, I love to listen to all the various reasons developers give us as to why they, their projects don't pencil, uh, I do feel like we need to spend some time really digging into that uh, and trying to see if we can come up with some creative methods or mechanisms to kind of help address that uh, from, from, our first, from our perspective. Um, there's a summary, as I mentioned in the report on kind of some of the various projects, uh, but just I'll touch on a few. So the Katati Villages project, which was approved out on Highway 116, the developer has indicated that project does not pencil uh, and they will not be moving forward with it. It's um, 43 single family homes and three commercial buildings fronting onto Highway 116, and that's located at the corner of Alder and Highway 116. They have indicated some interest in potentially re-entitling that project uh, as to replace the single family homes with a, a large number of multifamily homes. City staff have not seen any movement on that. And as I mentioned, the project is for sale, but there was some, some conversations, uh, I would say, you know, late 2020, uh, but since the beginning of this year, we have not seen any progress on that to date. Uh, the Katani Station project, which uh, I'm sure the council is very familiar with, 74-unit uh, apartment project in Sentara Way. Um, beautiful project, provides a city park, additional parking for that neighborhood. Uh, the developer has indicated they, they have not been able to, to get the project to pencil. Council will recall that um, the city council allocated $750,000 from the affordable housing fund to support development of that project as a 100% affordable project, which would have uh, well exceeded all of our arena allocation requirements in every income category. Uh, and after Bridge Housing, which is a very reputable, very uh, well-established affordable housing developer in the Bay Area, uh, took a hard look at it. Um, there were some changes to some of the grant funding opportunities that affordable housing projects normally rely on and they were not also able to make that project pencil and they, it's my understanding, have backed out um, and are no longer pursuing that project. And so it's back on the market. The developer has, uh, the property owner has indicated that they're seeking out affordable housing folks again um, because they're the only ones who they feel, uh, the owner feels will be able to finance the project given the, the various factors that are affecting the cost um, and the kind of additional funding sources that are available for those types of projects. And I'll just say, you know, anyone who calls us kind of inquiring about multifamily projects, I, I always connect those two and no one's been able to, uh, to make uh, a deal out of that. Uh, La Plaza View, which the council will recall is a kind of a smaller mixed use project right in downtown on the corner of East Katadi and um, Old Redwood Highway. Uh, or just, just east of that intersection, I should say. Um, they have not uh, moved forward, but they also have not said they're not going to. What they've said is they're interested in adding some residential units to that entitlement before they move forward with building permits, again, to help the project pencil. One of the things we're hearing is that, you know, even pre-COVID, commercial development was kind of speculative and there's not a lot of, um, not a lot of lending going on for, for new potential retail uses, uh, but housing was very strong. And so folks were kind of looking to housing to subsidize the commercial component of mixed use projects. Uh, and so in this case, I think they're just trying to bump up that number of residential units in order to help offset some of those costs for building out the commercial portion and obviously the whole site itself. Um, there's more details in the staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so just to talk about what we've done over last year in 2020, we had two new residential, 20 new residential units constructed, 16 single family homes, four ADUs. Majority of these are coming from the Kessing Ranch project. Um, they were all constructed as market rate homes. 
However, as you'll see in some of the notes of the report, if the city or any community can document um, that some of their market rate projects will be rented at, at affordable levels, then you can count those in your reporting. And so we did some research on the cost of rents for one bedrooms and studios uh, in Sonoma County. And, and we did uh, propose that four of our ADUs count as our affordable housing units. So I guess they're kind of some of the things we've been trying to champion with the affordable by design, smaller homes, you know, real estate's price per square foot. So smaller units, therefore less uh, costly and generally tend to be more affordable. Uh, and in this case, we are proposing that for those four ADUs be counted as affordable housing units for satisfying our arena. And I just to throw in a comparison there, uh, in 2019, we built seven units. So we have definitely stepped it up. Again, it's Kessing. Uh, and the Kessing project does have seven affordable housing project or units that we anticipate being built in this year, 2021. Uh, and those will be at very low, low and moderate income levels. So we will get a little bit more progress, uh, but I don't know that we're gonna meet the, the 25 number that we have remaining for very low. Uh, we also have Jamie Lane, which I did mention, but the council is well aware of that. And uh, we do plan on getting that final map submitted to the county for recordation. Uh, in the next week or two, which is very exciting because that will unlock some of the funds from the state and allow the developer to move forward with uh, construction on the site uh, in late spring or early summer. Um, table D in the report is kind of a, a summary of the efforts that we've been making to implement the housing element policies. And I'll just briefly touch on, you know, we've really made a lot of improvements to our website to share information both about development, but also about housing. Uh, this has been really critical in COVID, um, you know, during some of the, the eviction moratorium issues and just really trying to get information out there. And then also code enforcement, which is also a, a critical component of housing to make sure we don't have any substandard, house, substandard housing conditions. Uh, we help folks maintain the existing housing stock that we have, uh, those types of things. Uh, we also do continue to require uh, inclusionary housing units as the council is well aware, that's a, that's a state of city policy. Um, we're also really stepping up our coordination with regional partners. The Housing Land Trust is one and, and staff does hope to build on that relationship to try to improve kind of management of affordable housing in town. And then also with the Community Development Commission, um, that, that relationship has kind of um, intensified as more and more funding keeps coming down from the state. Uh, I do have some, some kind of complaints about how that's been going, but we're working with them to try to uh, improve that relationship and, and get a little bit more of a two-way street going with the county. And they've been hearing us loud and clear, I think, over the last few meetings, as all the small cities have coordinated in our in our messaging to them. Um, there's also some, some more work that we're doing. As we talked about, we have some grant funding to do some of the policy work I previously mentioned, and we do really want to study uh, kind of what some of the impediments are to our cost of construction. And I will mention the uh, Housing Land Trust and the Jamie Lane Project was the study of a white paper from two UC Berkeley graduate students. And it's actually um, nationwide, uh, it's, it's a part of HUD. And so it's, it's actually a very interesting read. I'm just getting into it, but I'm happy to forward a copy to the council if you'd like to see, but it touches on all of the kind of constraints to housing development in Sonoma County from a, a neutral third party kind of analysis perspective using the Jamie Lane project as a case study. So it's, it's really interesting. And if council is interested, I, I'll happily provide a copy. And um, we do plan on posting that on the website and just to kind of get some more information out there. Um, and then, you know, the things we've been doing are obviously our ADU ordinance and the other policy work. And then you will see uh, some of the, the engagement with the RCPA and our Climate Action 2020 plan, trying to push forward some of those uh, climate uh, related and greenhouse gas related policies. And, and we've talked about that in the coming budget cycle uh, for next fiscal year. And then obviously the buy right housing things that we continue to push through um, both the grant funded elements and then to meet the, the mandates and the policy direction of the housing element. Uh, Lauren, I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is just kind of a brief summary of where we're headed. So uh, this, and late this spring, we will get the kind of the final draft methodology from uh, HCB and the Association of Bay Area Governments or ABAG. There's, a, there's more background on this process in the staff report, but just to touch on it, uh, sorry, there's a typo there, but the RENA methodology is based on a set of statutory objectives from the state 
and local input from all of the Bay Area cities and counties. I think there was 90 communities represented in that, uh, the housing methodology committee meetings, which I participated in directly, uh, kind of as a Sonoma County delegate. Um, we didn't get everything we wanted, but I do think there was a lot of, a lot of good policy work that did come out of that. Um, summer and fall, they're gonna release that draft allocation uh, for all the local communities. That allows uh, formal appeals to be filed if, if there's those will, those are to be made. Council can direct staff to appeal if they feel it's necessary. Staff does not feel uh, it's necessary. I actually feel like a arena number uh, that, as of right now anyway, uh, is very fair. There's been kind of some last minute adjustments. Um, Healdsburg and Sebastopol took kind of a hit uh, because there was an equity adjustment that was included in the goal with that is to provide folks who are in the lower income categories access to some of these, what they call high resource communities. So places that have very good schools, uh, very good access to healthcare and all those benefits of, uh, of frankly, communities that have higher resources. And so the, that equity adjustment resulted in some pretty significant numbers for Sebastopol and Healdsburg and some of the other uh, more affluent barrier communities. Uh, but I think Katati's number is very fair. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, late 20 this year, uh, they'll adopt those final allocations. And then in January, 2023, um, those housing elements are due to HCD and, and we're gonna be kicking off an RFP to get that moving um, even prior to the fiscal year. And with that, I'll go to the next slide. So these are draft numbers, but it's worth rate. This is the Sonoma County draft allocation. And so you'll see Katati there, Lauren, if you just click one more time, it might highlight the number. There you go, 267 units is our arena allocation up from the 143, I think, uh, or 147 that we had in the last cycle. So in the grand scheme of things and where we are with our housing needs, that, that is a fair number from the staff perspective. Um, you can see some of the other communities had some pretty significant numbers uh, and then if you compare those to where they were before, um, there was huge increases from their perspective. And the one that's kind of concerning is the unincorporated Sonoma County number, um, because what that's gonna force the county to do is to build more housing in the, just outside of the cities where there's available utility resources. Um, obviously putting housing out in the middle of nowhere isn't gonna work, there's no infrastructure, there's no, tr no transit, any of those things. And so what's gonna happen is the county is gonna look to up zone sites directly around existing cities to take advantage of all that infrastructure to actually support the housing. Um, so yet to be determined where those sites are, but the county is being very forthright and proactive in telling cities what they're pursuing to rezone sites in their individual spheres of influence. So basically just outside the city limits uh, and have conversations about those which are just starting to occur. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, and with that, it's recommended that the council review the provided information, identify any concerns or direction of staff, and then file the report uh, because we need to sub submit this to the state by April 1st. So we're just in time. I apologize. I meant to get on the last agenda, but um, the report's complete and ready to go. And we'd happy to hear any comments that the council has. Thank you, Mr. Hush. Um... Let's see, Council Member Ford, looks like you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so, you no, know, a couple of questions. So, our current housing element is a is an eight year element. You said it can be either four or eight, I think. So, are, are we anticipating we'll go for another eight year housing element next time around? That's correct. We'll have eight years. The the four year is essentially a penalty if if the state finds that you're not doing a good job. You know, as okay. then they kick you to a four year to to force you to make change a little faster. Got it. And is it just luck that we're on a, like we, we do our housing element just after we get a new arena allocation? I mean, that seems like good timing for us. Uh, so the arena, um, they time it on purpose. So there's, they, there's a lot of kind of regional planning that all comes together and it's a little bit, uh, it's tied to some of the transportation requirements, which are on a four year cycle, um, but it's, some people say it's very well coordinated between the state, the kind of regional governments, and then us, uh, and, and then the state alternates between Southern California and Northern California and able to manage all of that work all at one time. So Southern California is ahead of us, and that's how we were able to kind of get some of the um, reading the tea leaves on where we were headed, you know, obviously separate from just the need for housing in general. Uh -huh. 
Thanks. And then a couple of questions about the unincorporated pressures. So first of all, how does the sort of county authority to permit housing intersect with, say, voter-approved green belts or urban growth boundaries? So that's a good question. So the county controls the land that's outside the city's jurisdiction, right? So the green belts are required community separators, and so there are some kind of mandates on development in those areas. But with the urban growth boundaries, all that is is a limit on where the city can expand to. It doesn't affect the county in the same way. But you can imagine if we have an urban growth boundary, then any infrastructure planning is going to stop at that line, which from the county's perspective means that they need to be inside that line to take advantage of sewer and water treatment, you know, the main things that are needed. And so let's say that happens. There's a parcel outside but contiguous with our city limits, and that property owner applies to annex and build affordable housing. Do those units count in our allocation or the county's? So if they were to annex and then build in the city, there's a couple different ways. Sometimes the county and the city would share those units, but it's basically in flux right now because the state law has been changing so much. Historically, in my experience in Sonoma County, cities would often allow those developments to go ahead and occur in the county because there's specific rules about annexation. It has to be a logical extension. If it's not contiguous, then you actually can't annex. So you would have to try to annex a bunch of parcels in between, and sometimes those folks might not want to come in. So there's a lot of factors. But just say a parcel like three or four parcels away from the city limits were then to develop under the county, that would likely be close enough to cover the cost of extending those utilities. LAFCO gets involved. They have to approve both annexations and utility extensions. But there's just going to be a lot of different tensions involved with growth limits, urban growth boundaries, community separators, logical extensions, and then the county trying to meet the state mandate that's been pushed on. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a small question, a big question. The small question was about some of the levels of the average, sorry, I'm losing track, the average rent for junior accessory dwelling units versus attached accessory dwelling units. It looked like if I was reading that right, that attached units average somewhere around $1,300 a month, whereas the junior units, which are presumably maybe even smaller, were $1,800 a month. Can you explain? I just wasn't understanding why the... You know, those numbers might have been converse. It might have been transposed. I'll have to look into that before we submit, but thank you for that. I worked with another staff member on putting it together, so I will research that. Okay, that was a small one. Thank you. And then the second, the bigger question was just relating to Councilmember Ford's question. What do you think the community... I mean, I know you can't predict this, but just what's your feeling that the communication would look like between the county and the city as they start to look at developing around us? Yeah, so what I would say is, you know, all of the planning staff in the entire county are very well, work very well together and are very well kind of... We coordinate well. So we meet monthly. SETA facilitates those meetings. Frankly, most of us have worked together our entire careers, so we all know each other pretty well, and we can have very frank and open conversations. And what I would say is the county has already indicated that they are starting to identify their sites that they're going to have to upzone to meet this allocation that the state has mandated that they meet. And so as they're doing that, they are going to engage with cities basically at the same time that they're starting to identify these sites. The site selection process, as I mentioned, there's a ton of changes. The site selection process has also completely been changed. And so historically, some, you know, the counties or cities kind of would have these set of large undeveloped parcels. They would kind of recycle them through their housing elements. But what the state is saying is, look, if those aren't developing, there's a reason why. And the point is we need housing now. So we're not going to let you recycle these same properties over and over again. 
without you jumping through significant hoops to document why we should let you do that. And so what we're anticipating is that that's gonna push some to change and you'll have to have new sites identified as housing opportunity sites. Those will then have to be up zoned to allow the density needed to meet the mandate. The county has over 5,000 units that they're supposed to build over the next eight years. And so um, I hope that answers your question, but basically I do anticipate a lot of open communication and then obviously where it'll, the rubber will hit the road is when something is actually proposed and there's some frustration in the different sides of the communities, uh, you know, and it's, it's maybe seen as sprawl, even though it's a county development, but it's right on the edge of the city, those types of things. Uh, and it's worth noting the city council also has to approve outside area connections. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Scott, city engineer, just sent me a message uh, to point that out. But um, it, it'll be a little bit of a political conversation once those, those things are coming before us. Mr. Mayor, if I could make a quick comment about the county. Absolutely. Um, so, so the, you know, the way, the way Noah described it, the rubber meets the road when somebody proposes a project on one of the county's proposed sites. But uh, one comment I wanna make is once, once uh, a particular site is in the county's housing element, whoever owns that land has tremendous rights under the housing element law uh, to develop a, a project that's consistent with that housing element site language in the housing element so that I, I think the real action is when the county is working on its housing element and is identifying, if, if they identified a site outside of Katadi that you were concerned about, you'd wanna get into the mix at that stage rather than waiting until a development project is proposed. Does that make sense to you, Noah? I absolutely agree with you and, th and thank you for pointing that out because as Mr. Bacher has, has said, once you are a housing opportunity site designated that property, it, it's, the, the developers have a lot of rights to develop and there's almost no stopping. So that is an excellent clarification. And I apologize for, for um, not being as, as uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Lerman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, for some years now, really always worried that this strong, push for housing from the state um, would lead to sprawl. Um, and clearly sprawl is an outcome, it looks like, of this, whether it's purposeful or unintended, that looks like this will be a consequence. Um, I guess the question I would have is how can we as a city work to protect the voter approved green belts surrounding our community? Um, this was something that was strongly important to the community at the polls numerous times, not just here, but throughout the county. And I'm not making the county the villain here. I recognize they've been put in a difficult position by the state's actions, but we can see where this is leading. So I guess my question is, what can we do? A strategic planning around being proactive and thoughtful about where we place resources that could lead to be favorable to annexation in terms of uh, roads, uh, power, sewer, water, that perhaps in the, in the past we might not have thought twice about. It strikes me without that, um, the, count, the rural aspect surrounding our community that people value so much potentially is in a difficult place, certainly just as Mr. Bacher suggested. Yeah, I mean, from, from my standpoint, the couple of things that, that we could do as a city would be one, if the county does choose to file an appeal, uh, which I believe there's at least one jurisdiction uh, in our county that wants to file an appeal, one city, and, and the county maybe as well, um, then maybe we could write some letters in support of that. The other thing would be for the city to kind of identify areas where growth would be acceptable that are maybe outside the city limits, but in the county jurisdiction. Um, so that way we could kind of work with the county to lobby, say, look, these parcels seem the most appropriate uh, areas for growth given where, because ultimately an urban growth boundary is where a city could grow to. And so what that could allow is, is the county to develop, get the credit in today's world, but then understanding that eventually that will become part of the community and it's gonna function as part of the community, even if it's right outside in a different jurisdiction. So those are the types of things that, that we could do that I can think of right off the bat 
there's some other there's some other things that the state has changed the law on like we used to be able to partner with the county and kind of share arena youth credits the state has taken that away um and then one final thing, I think Senator McGuire has a, has a uh, bill, or at least is considering a bill that would allow units built today to carry through into the next cycle. So if we were to overbuild in today's cycle, let those count to the next, because that way um, it's just basically a little bit more planning because those dates become somewhat arbitrary, right? Like if we were getting to the end of our cycle and I had a developer pushing to build, I might try to strategize some way to to actually push them later into the into the next cycle so we can get credit. But this there's also the cycles of the economy that this developer would be trying to target, and you would run the risk of missing that, and then nothing happens. And so there's just a lot of a lot of moving pieces there. And, and I I think as we start looking at the housing element update. Uh, Vice Mayor Landman, that's a very uh, important thing that we should be thinking about because we're all, every community in this county is going to be updating our housing elements at the same time and identifying these sites that are going to give significant development rights to those property owners. I see this as problematic because even if we were to, and I would be certainly open to supporting the county and asking for a variance or pushing back on the requirement they've been given, but we know what will exactly happen to those numbers countywide. They won't change, they'll be redistributed with the cities picking up more which leads to a different type of sprawl. Um, that, so, that, that's correct. Santa Rosa has indicated a willingness to take more units. And that's a bright spot because there are some areas where actually this is workable, um, much more workable. So I guess, yeah, I have some hesitancy about some of that. Certainly allowing the county to come in and develop areas within the UGB uh, that we will eventually take. I don't like the idea of letting the county develop the future of part of our community. What I've seen in the last few years in terms of some of the proposals that have come forward in the unincorporated area close to Katati have been somewhat concerning. So I'm not sure if that's actually an, an ideal thing either. But at any rate, this is something I hope staff will be thinking about and we'll all need to work on because clearly we've been put in really a no-win situation here and I think we're gonna have to try and find the best, best path forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Lyman. Uh, Council Member Harvey. Yes, no, I can't remember. So when they're doing that housing element and they identify a property and they're going to change um, that property to include it in the housing development, does that owner have to know that you're going to include them or do they just do it and then all of a sudden the, the owner finds out? <laughs> I've seen it both ways in my career. Uh, I will say any land use changes that are proposed in a, in a jurisdiction where I am I'm involved, I will they will be notified. But I have seen cities make significant changes to people's land use and not notify them directly. Because you could also see where the, you know, as was pointed out, you know, the ruralness of the area, there are some people that own property that want their property to stay rural. And so it would be a little concerning to all of a sudden find out that, oh, well, your property changed from rural and now, you know, uh, apartment complexes can go there. I mean, that would be a little, um, I think, frightening to some of these owners. So there is no um, requirement that people are notified is what well, I and I can't, I can't speak to that because it has been, I would say, over a decade to, since I've seen that happen. And, and I'm, not, I'm not aware. There's been so many changes to the state law. Um, and, and I think even kind of an elevation of best practices. So I, I don't imagine that any jurisdiction would do that in today's environment. Uh, and there is requirements to notify all residents within a certain proximity as you're making land use changes. Um, so I, I think it will be more open and transparent in this cycle than maybe ever before, but it will also probably be more controversial in this cycle than ever before because of the required changes. Everybody's gonna to have to go looking for new sites, including Katani. So, yeah, because- Mr. Mayor, I have, a, I have another quick comment on this too. Sure. Uh, that is to say that um, uh, one unique thing about the sites that are required that under the housing element, they have to be the sites have to be feasible. So um, if 
if a jurisdiction proposed a housing element site and the property owner stood up at the hearing and said, this project is never going to happen over my dead body. I own this property and it's never going to happen. When it went up to HCD, HCD might say, that's not a feasible site and reject your housing element because the property owner is not cooperative. So that's a risk that a jurisdiction might take if it proceeded ahead without coordinating first with the property owner. But like Noah said, I'm not aware of any requirement that you directly contact the property owner before identifying their site as a housing element site. Because in a city of our size and bounded by other cities, the properties that are available are very limited. And without that approval, if you will, from the property owners to change it, we're really very limited. So if it's the example over my dead body, you're going to change my 10 acres into apartment buildings. If that's like the only piece of property left, what options do we have with the state? I mean, we're kind of bounded. It's not like we have a lot to be able to stretch out unless we change our urban growth boundary, which people do not want to do. I mean, they, again, renewed that. It's very important to people. And so I do anticipate in Katahdi specifically pushing to reuse some of our existing sites because they are great sites for housing and they're where we want some housing to go. And other ways you could increase the allowable density in some of the existing parcels. So that may be a way to stay more compact. But land use changes are likely to be required in order to meet the RENA. I'm anticipating a few in Katahdi. We're just starting to look at the site selection work, but definitely throughout the other communities in the county. Yeah, I guess it's unfortunate because folks like living in rural areas and we don't really want to become an L.A. People have fought very hard to keep this area rural and agricultural. So that is a little unfortunate. Vice Mayor Lennon. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have brought this up when I was speaking earlier. Forgive me. But just very quickly, Noah, the state's new concern about existing sites and blocking us from using them with the thought that these are bad sites because nothing's coming out of them. Just from the outside, my sense is I doubt if the majority of them are really bad sites. I think it's just the difficulty in funding the sorts of projects, particularly with lower cost and very low cost housing. And this is why what housing we get always seems to be market rate. So I'm curious, your take as a professional has been involved with this much longer. Is there really a problem with cities foisting bad sites forward on purpose? Or is it just the problem that we're trying to create housing without a funding source for it? I will say, you know, the communities who kind of have a reputation for being strongly anti-development, there's no question that some of their sites have been basically undevelopable. That is definitely a fact. I would say it's much more the exception than the rule. And I don't feel that it's any of the sites that I'm aware of in any Sonoma County jurisdiction are that way. They're just, you know, kind of victims of all the various constraints that we all face, you know, whether it's environmental resources that need to be protected or mitigated for, you know, the cost of construction. The average age of a carpenter in California is, I think, 47 years old or something. Plumbers are making $80 an hour. You know, I mean, it's just gotten very, very expensive and very, very quickly. And then we have the impacts from the fires and all those things specifically to us. And it's just it is a factor. But the state is kind of, I would say, maybe, you know, the pendulum swinging a little far in one way. Right. You know, because some there are some bad actors out there in the state of sued. Some of them, you all have probably seen that in the paper. But generally, most communities are not in that. And I take that that's a helpful answer. And I get the concern from the state's perspective and why they would be frustrated and want to deal with that. But I hope that as part of correcting this overswing of the pendulum, the pushback, the gentle and logical pushback could be 
This is a problem that needs a scalpel to fix it, not a sledgehammer. Uh, and doing, a, doing this to everybody may well create more problems, actually, rather than be helpful, rather than just zeroing in on some of the problem areas. Uh, granted, that would be more difficult, perhaps, to craft the rules necessary to do that, but I think it would really be worth the effort. So thank you for that, because I was curious. Uh, it did strike me that this doesn't seem logical, and I didn't really believe that the greatest amount of sites are truly problematic sites. It's just what I've seen in this decade, it's really hard to build, at least the type of building in particular that the state wants. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have a couple of quick questions. Um, Council Member Ford addressed the one regarding the uh, UGD, so thank you for that. Um, on Table D, and I don't know if this is something that you're going to be submitting to the state. Section um, 36, maintain adequate staff. I, I'm assuming that that was just a typo in there when it said uh, the city has entered an ongoing contract with outside consulting, et cetera, workflow of staff capacity in this will contract will continue into 2020. Oh. That is a typo. That, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. I need to update that. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then the only other thing I had that hasn't already been addressed was when you talked about the additional four ADUs that we're uh, going to be counting under the arena housing count, um, are there income verification standards for that? Yeah, so we do not, um, the, the state does not require us to go and check to see how much an ADU is being rented for. Uh, rather, we can do market research uh, and base, uh, based on average rents of what we're seeing, and, and I'll just use an example. They, I have heard, the HCD has said, you can submit kind of a, a, advertise, a newspaper article or a newspaper classified or a Craigslist ad showing this rent as your justification because if it falls in their categories then that allows them to um and you can document that you're that you're doing it that they do let you count it are there provisions to uh preclude things like uh being and vacation rental oh absolutely yeah if it's um well if uh if in an instance where a, a home was granted a vacation rental permit, then absolutely not. We, we could not count that. But to your point, I think, you know, if somebody builds a new ADU and we're saying this is going to be an affordable housing unit, but they're actually using it as a, as a short-term rental, um, that would be kind of a miss on our part. Uh, but the, the state al does allow us to count those as long as we can document that the rent is likely to be within the acceptable range. And yet, the state doesn't give us any wherewithal to substantiate or verify that. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no, of course not. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I will open it up for uh, public comment if we have anybody that makes, wants to make any comments on this. Thank you, Mayor, for our attendees. Just checking in. Please use your raised hand icon. And that will end public comment. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much for that comprehensive report. Uh, it's interesting when we have those mandates coming down from the state, and then we have to figure out how we're going to implement those. And of course, you know, I wonder how much of that is taken into consideration with the uh, all the pandemic issues, and then what's the future of work going to look like? Are we going to actually need the housing up here? Um, there are so many people that are vacating some of the bigger cities to have more space for home office or whatever it may be. So it's going to be interesting on that. So thank you for that. Mr. Mayor, okay. may I, may I ask uh, Absolutely. Sorry. Um, no, I, I just wanted to say, uh, yes, I definitely wanted to see that uh, white paper, if you could send that out. And also, I really appreciate you saying, um, that um, uh, you were interested in looking at ways that we can, like ex really examining 
what the why these projects aren't penciling out and I'm just if you could I would love to be included in whatever you find out so interesting. oh absolutely yeah we're, we're gonna the goal is to actually spend some of our grant money hiring consultants that this is what they do because we have the amount of effort it took to get Jamie Lane done and the amount of time we'll never build ourselves out of this problem if that's the example yeah so we need to get at least a good knowledge base so we can start making good decisions. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, and this is probably obvious, but this would be a, a council discussion, you know, when we start, when we have some results to start discussing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have the resolution to support solidarity with the Asian American Pacific Islander communities and denouncing anti-Asian racism and violence. Did you have a presentation on this, Mr. Arbit, or were you just looking at me to read that uh, resolution? Yeah. No, thank you. I'll, I'll just do a quick, uh, just a quick intro to it. So, um, uh, a little bit of background. This. Um, the proposed resolution in the packet tonight is uh, uh, a very, a very close model to a, um, a template resolution that Santa Rosa JC, um, their board recently adopted. I think um, specifically the most, you know, the most obvious example that triggered that was the um, shooting in Atlanta that um, that killed some Asian Americans and. Um, uh, it was unanimous, the JC um, board unanimously passed that resolution denouncing Asian Ameri American violence and um, and put a call out to other communities to help support that call and raise awareness of the issue. Um, and so uh, the thought was is that this item tonight, you know, we can do a small part perhaps in addressing the impact of violence and harassment against Asians. Um, by just raising awareness through this resolution um, officially and publicly. Um, so with that, I would, that's really all I wanted to uh, introduce it with, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Obeda. Um, Councilmember Ford. Um, I'm fully in support of us adopting something like this resolution. I just wanted to point out that the first two whereas clauses contain Content, content that's specific to the to the Santa Rosa Junior College. And actually, the first two whereas need to be adapted to fit the city of Katati. They currently contain quotes from the adopted values of the Santa Rosa Junior College and the mission of the Santa Rosa Junior College. So um, I've got some proposed change after, when we come back to, for comments after uh, public comment. But I just, uh, other than those two, the, the rest of the resolution is, is um, I mean, the SRJC has been changed to City of Katati throughout, and other some other appropriate changes have been made, but the first two whereas is, I, I think, still need some changes. Thank you, Councilmember Ford. Um, any other comments from the Council? Councilmember Sparks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say thank you uh, for putting this together so quickly, and uh, I just think it's so important that we denounce racism publicly because there are people in our community who are experiencing anti-Asian American racism day to day and um, we all just <laughs> need to stand against it as strongly as possible. So thank you for putting this together. Thank you, Councilmember Sparks. If I don't have any other council member comments or questions at this time, I will open up for public comment and then come back and address uh, my words on that resolution. Thank you, Mayor Moore. Mayor you had another question? Sorry, I was muted. That was a legacy raised hand. I put it down. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. Marjorie Crump Shears, go ahead. There, all right, here I am. Um, I am so glad that uh, Katati 
our city council is addressing the anti asian racism and violence there is violence going on against other groups of people as well i want to read something that i just saw from an organization that i'm a part of it's the playwrights foundation in san francisco and their statement is this racism is violence exploitation is violence disinvestment in communities of color is violence dehumanization of sex workers is violence racial fetishization oh i murdered that word is violence white supremacy is violence silence is violence speak out take action thank you for speaking out thank you miss from shares Lorianne Barber, go ahead. Hi, this is Lorianne Barber, and I also just want to thank the City Council for taking up this issue and speaking out uh, quickly to denounce anti-Asian racism and violence. Um, of course, we should denounce all racism and violence, and but I'm, I'm particularly glad to see this being raised at this time and want to support it strongly. Um, I sort of threw together a vigil on Sunday in La Plaza Park for uh, the people who were murdered in Atlanta and about 60 people showed up. They, they weren't all from Katati, they actually came from all over the place. So um, this is an issue that I think is important to local people. And um, so again, thank you for putting this on your agenda and I support it. Thank you, Ms. Barber. And Ms. Bridges, will that be in on public comment? And that will end public comment. Thank you very much. Um, I'll bring it back to the council in reference to language on that, that we might want to look at that resolution. Is that something that uh, we want to edit afterwards, or do we want to go ahead and make those edits at this point? Well, I, I'd be happy to propose replacements for the first two whereases, um, and if, if they're okay with everybody, we could make them. I think, I think it's problematic to pass it as is because of those quotes directly from the San Rosa Junior College uh, mission and values, which are, I, I want to um, repeat what one of the public commenters said about, um, I really appreciate how quickly Mayor Moore and City Manager Obit got this on the agenda. I know it came through just as we were getting ready to publish the agenda, so thank you for doing that. Um, but, but, so I'm happy to read some proposed replacements for those first two whereases and see if those work for people. Uh, I think you are more than welcome to take a stab at that, Councilmember Forrest. All right, so, the first one, which is about values, a possible replacement is, a, whereas the city of Katati values many forms of diversity among its, among its residents and visitors as sources of strength, creativity, perspectives, and insight, and, and I'm happy to find some way to get this to city clerk to get the language in, uh, whereas, and for the, for the second one about the mission, we don't have a, um, a mission that I can find, an adopted mission that I can quote from. So this is not a quote. This is um, a statement um, that is actually paraphrasing some things that are in an adopted vision, the vision for Katati. So whereas the mission of the city of Katati is to provide for an excellent quality of life, opportunities for economic development, and a welcoming and safe environment for all of its diverse residents and visitors. And my proposed replacements for the first two whereas it's any um, contributing comments from the 
อยู่ในนี้เราจะทำชั่วโมงไหม I was just going to add that we do have, as Councilmember Ford pointed out, we do have a vision statement that's that's adopted. And the second, whereas perhaps it would just say the vision of, you know, to be more correct. In my version, I replaced mission with vision in that second. Vice Mayor Nunez. Yeah, if there's no further comments, I'd be happy to move this resolution with the uh, edits made by Council Member Ford, as well as uh, Mr. Obid mentioning using vision. Uh, that appears to be amenable with everybody. I'm seeing nodding heads. So I'd like to move a resolution in support of solidarity with the Asian American Pacific Islander communities and denouncing anti-Asian racism and violence. A second that motion. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Um, Ms. Burgess, could you kindly do a roll call? Council Member Harvey. Yes. Council Member Sparks. Yes. Council Member Ford. Yes. Vice Mayor Landman. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes. Thank you very much. And I'll, um, before we move on to the next item, Mayor, just um, Council Member Ford, if you wouldn't mind um, forwarding that language to uh, the city clerk and myself, that'd be great. Thanks. Will do. Thank you. And um, now we'll move on to our city manager's report. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, all right, so quick put up the, um, as you know, the county vaccination program continues to transition to the state contractor, Blue Shield, in terms of managing it. We're currently in, uh, continue to be in phase 1B tier 1, so that's over 65 ag and food manufacturing restaurant workers. Um, a recent addition is an expansion to include anyone ages 16 to 64 that have issues that make them more susceptible to adverse health effects if they contract COVID. Um, vaccination rates have picked back up, but um, uh, appear to just continue to be con constrained by the supply available. We do continue to be in red uh, due to the cases per 100,000, which is now um, at 5.6. We need to be at or below four to get the orange, um, but we are on a slow trend downwards. And the positivity rate means, remains very low, so um, well within orange. At the federal level, uh, the, um, the 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill is now law, I think as everyone here knows. And on our website and also um, being pushed out to the Chamber of Commerce, there is a lot, and I would emphasize a lot of small business assistance becoming available. Um, in addition to approximately 31 million in rental assistance and um, also uh, utility payment assistance, from prior, even prior legislation, not even the current legislation, that the county plans to make available by the middle of April if things stay on, things stay on track. Um, projects, the West Sierra Avenue safety project contract documents are being processed and kick off, the kickoff meetings expected next week with construction start mid-April. Um, it shouldn't take too long. It's a fairly straightforward project. Um, it will install a three-way stop at the intersection of West Sierra Avenue and um, West School, and also crosswalk improvements at West Sierra at Cypress. The bid documents for the community center re-roof and window replacement project are nearly complete. So the project, that project is expected to bid next month with, uh, um, uh, with the results of that coming to council. And if assuming the council authorizes the contract um, tentatively under construction in May. Um, again, as I mentioned last council meeting um, for water, this year we're still in a dry, dry, very dry year um, based on uh, the record of rainfall. Um, I think it's the third driest year on record. And so the city, um, like all the cities in this region are promoting, it's a dry year, save water with us campaign. And um, even in spite of these recent rains, as of March 18th, Lake Mendocino was a little under 50% of its target water supply level in Lake Sonoma was at 63% of its target water supply level. So the, um, in our own website, there's also the Summer Marin Water Saving Partnership website, which has 
water skipping tips if anyone is um, interested in knowing what they can do to help save water. Also, um, I did mention at the last council meeting at this time that the uh, local roads and safety um, plan website was up, um, technically up right at that time. It, um, it is live and the link is on the public works page of the city website. And um, uh, I know that we are working on um, uh, pushing that out widely on headlines and social media. I think they're just trying to pull together the content for those both. So stay tuned, you should hear much more about this soon. Um, on community in the community development realm, the cottage ordinance, cottage housing ordinance was, um, uh, was approved and recommended by the planning commission. And so the council will be seeing that soon. Also, um, they had an initial, an initial workshop on the objective design guidelines for housing. So, um, the planning commission, there was a lot of discussion about the objective design guidelines and it sounds like there'll be a lot more discussion at the planning commission level before, um, uh, and a lot more public comment taken before we move that forward. But anyway, that continues to occur. Um, just a reminder again, another reminder from last, the last meeting, the city will be hosting one of several drop-off sites in Sonoma County sponsoring uh, or sponsored by the, um, by the DEA, it's a prescription drug drop-off. Um, since a lot of lobbies have been closed, these, um, these uh, prescription drug take-back programs have, haven't had a lot of outlets. So it's a um, good opportunity to, um, to, to try to collect a lot of those drugs and get them out of people's homes so that they aren't flushed or thrown in the garbage. This um, drop-off day will be Saturday, April 24th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the community center to drive through drop-off. And then um, oh, one other thing I neglected to mention, but I wanted to point out was the uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Their guide is supposed, supposed to launch tomorrow. Um, and this program provides property owners with private wells an opportunity to review and update water use information. Um, there's a chance mailers will be sent to property owners without wells. And in those cases, it's helpful to return the mailer indicating there's no well on the property. So there are some um, properties within the city of Katati that do have wells. So those, um, if those mailers go out um, in the next two weeks, some people may be getting those. So it's just a heads up on that. And then um, finally, recreation. Um, this week, we are currently hosting our sold out Camp Katati Spring Break Camp. This week is off, um, is off to a great start with campers playing games, making crafts, doing science projects and more. And we're excited for a fun filled rest of the week and look forward to continuing camp this, this summer. Um, this coming Sunday, we will be hosting our Bunny Brunch to Go event. And um, this drive-through event will allow registered families to come get a pancake, egg, and sausage breakfast to go, goodie bags with stuffed eggs, and craft kits for kids, and a chance to take photos with the bunny. And um, our bunny helpers are all very excited to see everyone who's been working hard to create a fun environment for all attendees. And they're still available online to pre-register um, if you would like to go. Pre-registration is required. And um, so hold on, I got some bad puns on this one, but next April, uh, or I'm sorry, next Thursday, April 1st, we will be delivering bunny grams around Katati to those who signed up. Each gram will include a, a basket filled with a dozen pre-filled eggs with candy and other goodies, a small stuffed animal stickers and more. We are egg-sided to hop around town. So give us a quick wave if you see us, so you'll be seeing some people around delivering these with bunny ears on. And uh, there, are, there are a few baskets still available, so sign up on our website to secure one for you or some bunny you love. That's sorry, that's the last one. Um, stay tuned for more events and programs coming um, back next month. And we're also excited to announce the return of Zumba Gold and Aikido, as well as continuing children's theater programs. And we're also expecting to um, start up drive, uh, driving movies soon and bring back the community yard sale this spring. And then lastly, in the park news, the Katati Park Playground Survey uh, should be live tonight. So if you missed our community workshops, but would like to see uh, what playground options we are considering, check out the short survey we'll have available on our website and social media pages. So we look forward to continuing the playground update, update process and appreciate the community's feedback. And lastly, as always, if you have any questions about recreation programs or events, you can contact Ashley 
Wilson at 665-4222, or awilson at katadicity.org, or of course, always on our website in the city's Facebook page. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Obed. Uh, it does look like we have uh, some questions, and um, I would uh, invite all of my fellow council members to uh, let out a big groan if you'd like. You're welcome to do that. And Council Member Sparks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Damien, I noticed the bunny grams on April Fool's Day. Is there a prank version of the bunny gram that we can send out? That's an excellent question. Um, well, they are going to ring ring doorbells and run, is what I hear, right? So, I although supposedly there are legitimate baskets of uh, goodies. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Obeda. It does not appear that there's any further questions at this time. Now we can move on to our city council member report. Uh, council member Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a few. Um, Damien already mentioned the guide program um, from the uh, groundwater sustainability. In addition to that, they will be um, doing the focus groups. I pushed pretty hard to have an additional um, focus group for our Santa Rosa Basin since we had um, the most wells, the most surveys returned, and the most interest in being part of a focus group. So hopefully the consultant has gone back to try and figure out how, how to make that happen. But um, it was agreed that we really don't wanna um, turn away people that want to help guide that. So um, secondly, I attended the first education meeting that we had, it was a great meeting. Um, it was really more of an introductory meeting so everyone could um, greet one another and meet one another and um, we um, introduced our backgrounds and things like that and we will start meeting regularly again which is I think great everybody was pretty um, enthusiastic about that so I think that that that'll be great uh, then I attended um, a meeting um, with Senator Dodd he spoke to um, all the folks from the North Bay Division and he had like a whole list of bills and things that he's um, actually working on, but he spent um, a good hour with us, which was wonderful. And lastly, I attended the Sonoma County Waste Management Agency meeting. Um, I already asked for the environmentally preferred purchasing policy. We approved the draft budget. And a, one thing of note that I want to make sure that people are aware of is that with the um, treated wood waste and the laws that went into effect and the ability to dispose of that not being available, um, the Waste Management Agency will be having an event. Um, it is scheduled for 425 um, at Luther Burbank. They are not charging. The agency is going to pick up the fees to dispose of that material. Um, sign up will be required and there will be only 160 slots. So, um, and then depending upon how that goes, they may do another one, but until that gets um, kind of squared away better, it's not really feasible for people to have to go as far as they would have to go to get rid of that. So I, that's really good news is that we're gonna be able to hold those events until that gets squared away. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Councilman Harvey. Um, any other council member reports at this time? I am not seeing any hands up. Um, I do have a remit meeting coming up on Thursday the 25th quite a few items on there. Uh, so we'll report out after that. I do want to indicate that um, I was very proud of our participation in the recent um, press release, um, live video feed that the County of Sonoma held yesterday and recognizing um, some of the racism and the support of uh, Vice Mayor Elwood in, in uh, Runner Park and in support of 
with the Asian American Pacific Islander community. So um, that was a nice event. I thought the participation by our council and the support for that was, was very good. Uh, so I don't have anything further to report out on that. Um, we can open it up for uh, public comment on non-action agenda items if we have any attendees that are interested in speaking on that. Thank you, Mayor Moore. I'll check in with our attendees. Thank you. And it appears there are no public comment. Thank you very much, Ms. Burgess. And do we have any information received after the agenda is posted? Nothing further. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have anything further to add. Um, I thank you all again and um, look forward to our next, I think we have a, a budget study session coming up before the next council meeting, is that correct? I don't have the dates in front of me. No, I believe our next um, council meeting is the 13th of April and then the budget study session I believe is on the 20th of April. Okay, okay. Well, thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing you. And if I don't see you in the meantime, have a very nice holiday and be safe out there. And we will adjourn the meeting at 8.52 p.m. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.